Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm going to try without the mic because it'll be easier than holding this the whole time. But if you can't hear me, let me know and I'll, I'll switch over. How is it so far? Good. All right. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a philosopher. So I know this is the uh, Origin Science Association. We're going to be looking at science, but we'll be maybe doing it sort of as the philosophy of science. And I also like to have a kind of Socratic method of interaction. So I do have some uh, notes to share with you, but I might also kind of break that up with some questions and some interaction with you. So I'm looking forward to that and hearing about what you've been learning about origins. Behind me, I have one of my uh, web pages. It's kind of a reading <coughs> I've put together. And one of the readings I have, I have a number of readings with study questions. And one of them is from Darwin, from the Origin of Species. And so I have selections here and a web page to the full text. And I'm going to be going through some of these together. I'll highlight them, the, the parts we're looking at, and uh, point to them. I'm going to be talking tonight about uniformitarianism. Now that's not a common word, and it's kind of a cumbersome word. I don't know if you'll be using it a lot once you leave class. It, it could be a good word if you want to try to look or sound smart, right? If you're at, at a party or you get together, you could drop uniformitarianism into the sentence and it sounds like you're talking about something. So what is it? And why would someone want to talk about it? And that's pr precisely what I'm going to be laying out tonight. And I'll help you understand what a philosopher has to do with talking about origins and about science. So let me summarize all of this by saying that what we're, what we're doing together is critically analyzing or critically thinking about Darwinism. And Darwin specifically. Right, those are two separate things, Darwinism and then Darwin himself. Critical thinking is a kind of buzzword in the academy. It's a positive term that everybody wants to use, and everybody is for critical thinking. Do they talk about critical thinking here? Are you supposed to learn how to be a critical thinker? But it seems like a kind of an empty phrase because it leads to divergent and competing outcomes, right? People from very different uh, perspectives will say they're doing critical thinking, and they'll come to competing conclusions. So what is critical thinking? By critical thinking, what I mean here is minimally the work of identifying assumptions or presuppositions and testing them for meaning. So that's a two-part process. It can be hard enough to simply identify assumptions. A lot of times in origins discussions, assumptions are very different and people get into deadlock about origins they can't get anywhere and they're not even aware of the assumptions they brought to the table, right? So just that ability to learn to identify our assumptions when we talk about origins would be a big step forward. So that's one part of critical thinking. Are you able to even identify your own assumptions? First, it might be easier you know, if you're pointing out the other guy. You say, I know your assumptions. But so the first step of critical thinking is self-examination. Do I know mine? And then the second part of that is uh, learning how to test these for meaning. So we're going to look at both of these. And assumptions, or I'm also using the word presuppositions. A presupposition is a belief that needs to be true if our original belief is to be true. So we make some kind of an assertion. Let's say it's about origins. Well, that assertion has presuppositions that would have to be true for our assertion to also be true. And that's the work of critical thinking, going back and looking at what are those. So an example would be if you believe God answers prayer. Well, for that to be true, it have to, this presupposes that God is real. Right? It would have to be the case that God is real. So the presupposition must be true for the supposition to be true. So test a belief for meaning includes using reason as the laws of thought to look for contradictions. Now, the contradictions could be external contradictions, like a belief, th this belief contradicts something else that we know, but they could also be internal contradictions. It involves a kind of internal inconsistency. Many times, especially in philosophy, that's what we're looking at. Science might look more for external contradictions. Uh, it's not exclusive, but many times philosophy is doing the other one, of looking for internal mm -hmm. contradictions. So those two things, critical thinking. Identify our presuppositions and test them for meaning. So that's our method. And critical thinking is wonderful. You like to do critical thinking? Like your friend calls you up, hey, what do you want to do tonight? It's Friday night, what should we do? Hey, want to do critical thinking? Yeah, good idea. You know what they say? It's one of my favorite things, if you want to get to know me a little bit. 
one of my favorite things. Uh, it's one of my favorite things because the goal of critical thinking is meaning. And meaning is one of my favorite things. Do you like meaning? In fact, you might even say it's my favorite thing. Since without meaning, you have meaninglessness and you see the problem, right? So, we all want meaning. We could say it's our most basic need. When we feel as if there's no meaning, we don't even, we push food away. We don't want to hang out with friends, right? Because they, they have these lists of needs, right? Like air, food, water, friends. But you'll push all those aside if your life is meaningless. That's our most basic need. So the meaning of our lives uh, involves this idea of understanding or coherence, comprehension. The meaning of our lives and of the world involves understanding our origin. Where do things come from? What's eternal? So see, we're connected with origin. Where did everything come from? What has existed from eternity? That's one of the first philosophical questions we ask. And, and, and also our purpose. Where are we going? Where do we come from? Where are we going? And this is where Darwin fits into our discussion, what we're talking about tonight. Darwin is giving us a theory of origins. And we want to look at what it says and what it presupposes. That's what I'm mostly doing tonight. What does it presuppose? Do we need a century and a half of intense scientific debate? Or do we know right away what it presupposes and if those presuppositions are true or not? That's one thing they'll say about philosophers. They don't, they're not known for heavy lifting. They have inside jobs, right? Pencil, pen, and some paper. So I can avoid a century and a half of work. Do you think I'll try to do that? Just by noticing, oh, you have a false presupposition. I don't want to spend a century and a half on it. Is that lazy? They say work wiser, not harder, right? So it would be fair at this point to ask this question. Hasn't all of this already been discussed? It has been. It's been, it's been some time, century and a half, since Darwin wrote this theory. And since he did that, there's been political, legal, religious, and personal battles about evolution. What new thing can be said? Maybe nothing. That's what's nice about not aiming to say something new. Philosophy doesn't have that same uh, uh, weight on it to always have some new idea. It's OK to have an old but true idea. So maybe nothing new can be said, but that's, that's not a bad thing. Let's not make that our goal here. Instead, let's make our goal critical thinking about Darwin. Let's look at his presuppositions and test them for meaning. And if this has already been done many times before, then we're in good company. And if it hasn't been done at all, then we'll contribute something new that way. My suspicion is that it hasn't been done in the way that we're going to be doing it, and I have some reasons to support this. The main reason is that this debate has largely been allowed to go on as one of science versus religion, or science versus revealed religion, or science versus scripture. So someone will uh, hold up a fossil, and someone will quote a Bible verse. And this is how the debate has gone for some time. And each of these, the quote science side, has, because I know we'll want to dispute that and say, is that science or not? But so the quote unquote science side has been given the whole area of natural religion or general revelation as its domain. And we're going to question that here. That's one of the things I want to question. As a philosopher, that's my field general revelation, natural theology. We're going to say instead that it's not science versus religion, but it's philosophy critically analyzing both. Because I think anybody, even if they tend towards the religion side, would be willing to say that there have been false conclusions in religion also. So we need to apply critical thinking to both of those sides. Now let me give some examples of doing this by working through some portions of Darwin. Now, as I said, you can find this on my web page. I use it for uh, readings in my classes. And the link is up there. It's thehighestend.blogspot.com. Highest end taken from a uh, quote from Aristotle, all things aim at some end, and the good is that highest end. What is the good? So I have that there, and then also, as I mentioned, there's a link to the full text. So if you want to say, where do you, where do you find these things? I'm going to double check. Let's look at some quotes here to emphasize or illustrate the idea of critical thinking. 
I might read some of these. And I, I kind of debated in my mind about that as I thought about this. And I decided, yeah, I think I will read them and work through them with you. Because a lot of times people say things about Darwin. And it's useful sometimes just to have the text and go through it and see what, what does he say, right? I, I think of this mainly as a kind of philosophical text where he's proposing certain, uh, a certain philosophy. And we can wrestle with that and see if it's true or not just by reflecting on it. So in this first one, that, oh, it may not, this may not work on the screen. Yeah, it's really dim. Sorry. You can kind of see that, huh? So starting here, I have called this first principle by which each slight variation, if useful, is preserved that by the term natural selection in order to mark its relation to man's power of selection. But the expression often used by Mr. Herbert Spencer of the survival of the fittest is more accurate and is sometimes equally convenient. We have seen that man by selection can certainly produce great results and can adapt organic beings to his own uses through the accumulation of slight but useful variations given to him by the hand of nature. But natural selection, as we shall hereafter see, is a power, power incessantly ready for action and is as immeasurably superior to man's feeble efforts as the works of nature are to those of art. So bringing us into his thinking process, he's asking the question, how do we get variation of species? When we look at any species, humans included, we see a lot of differences, right? Well, where do these come from? So that's his question, and that's a legitimate question. There's no reason not to try to answer that question. We're going to look at how does he try to answer it? What are the presuppositions he has which then limit the kinds of answers he gives? And he's comparing it to human selection, right? So humans can, through breeding, do quite a lot. Have you seen all the different sorts of dogs they have at the dog store? Now, sometimes, I think today we probably select them based on which one strikes us as the cutest. But in many cases, they, they have these different looks for different kinds of things they were bred to do, right? Like bear baiting. Which dog was that? Or uh, badger hunting or uh, shepherding, right? You have different dogs for these sorts of things. So humans can do this. He's going to suggest that uh, these same kinds of variations come about just by things reproducing and struggling with each other. That shapes what kinds of differences come out. So that's the next uh, paragraph here. Nothing is easier than to admit, in words, the truth of the universal struggle for life, or more difficult, at least I have found it so, then constantly to bear this conclusion in mind. So we have a universal struggle for life. And that is going to be how he explains this differentiation. And, and I wonder what you think about that. If you were aware of some of the uh, literature occurring at the same time, or with, w in a, a, a modern British thought, it would be called, you, you might bring to mind Thomas Hobbes. Life is short, brutish, and nasty or more uh, close to Darwin, you might remember Thomas Malthus, who talked about how populations grow exponentially until they don't have enough food anymore, and then they uh, start to starve. And so populations grow in, 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 to fit their environment and how much food they have. So these are some of the influences on Darwin. And, and had you thought that? Is there a universal struggle for survival? Do you struggle for survival? Pretty easy. have been? I mean, it takes some work, but is work the same as struggle? Maybe, you, maybe you've come a ways with human civilization right now. But the animals, I think I heard uh, coyotes as we came in. Do they struggle here to survive? It's difficult, and there could be uh, certain adaptations that some coyotes get that make it so they survive better than other coyotes and therefore they pass on their genes, and that's what he's talking about, right? Question, is that process sufficient to account for the origin of all species? We're not talking about variation alone. We're talking about origin. Is that sufficient to account for origin? Second, has there always been struggle for survival? He's going to say it's always been there. What do you think at Arizona Christian University? Yeah. Not in the garden. You say no. Was original creation very good? Yes. 
Did suffering come before or after sin? After. Is that an incidental point, maybe added in for poetic purposes? Or is it connected to the very goodness of God? And which is removed, sin or death, physical death? You have that at the end. You have it at the beginning? So you might say, oh, that's the uh, Genesis account. But it's in the Christian account uh, at the end of how these are removed as well, right? After sin is removed, death is removed. So this is not an incidental or accidental piece of the Christian worldview, nor am I, am I, what I'm talking about tonight, am I saying that it's merely revealed religion. I'm using that to illustrate the point. I think we can know this from general revelation. We can know that God, if God is perfect in goodness and power, that he would have made a world without evil in it. So let's keep going, but let's notice that. Darwin thinks there's always been suffering. The struggle for existence. So he says here, a struggle for existence inevitably follows from the high rate at which all organic beings tend to increase. This is from Thomas Malthus, the economist I mentioned. And this is a theme for Darwin, is that you're just going to keep having this increase of population, and so then there's scarcity of food. Now that's also talked about in Genesis 3. So we have uh, uh, struggle for survival. We briefly mentioned Genesis 3, but it names explicitly the struggle for food to Adam. Do you remember what it says to Adam? going from the garden where you have plentiful food to working by the sweat of your brow. It names that. That's toil for food, right? Scarcity. So that wasn't original and is therefore a purpose, right, in response to what Adam had just done. So Darwin's taking that as a formative basic piece that explains all the rest of life. And coming down here. There is no exception to the rule that every organic being naturally increases at so high a rate that, if not destroyed, the earth would soon be covered by the progeny of a single pair. So he has this idea that the, the living creatures will just keep expanding. I've heard this before. Someone will say, well, death is necessary to check populations. And so death has always been there just as part of life. So here we're starting to get some of his presuppositions into focus, right? It's, it's, it's connected up to this problem of evil. Let me recommend a book about this called Darwin's God by Cornelius Hunter. And he especially looks into some of Darwin's uh, diary that he wrote as he was coming up with this idea, some of the influences on Darwin, and his understanding of goodness of God and whether or not God would have created a world like we see it. And he concluded, no, God wouldn't have made a world like we see it because he's too good. And so the world must be explained by some other principle. And that's what he's trying to figure out. And so in, in one way, you can start to relate to that. Because you can, he, he's missing the point that, that death is not original. And he's saying God would have made things this way with so much suffering and waste. And he's looking for another solution. So his, his natural selection is set in contrast to human breeding. Simply by struggling through life, mm -hmm. organisms that reproduce are going to do so in a way that selects some and not others. But notice that this takes, he takes this condition as absolute. As I said before, is that sufficient to explain the origin of all life? I mean, it might be sufficient to explain variations, but it's to explain origins. And that's what we're talking about now is origins. And that's what he's talking about. And we know he's talking about that because it's the title of his book. So he can't say we're, he can't say we're imposing that on him, right? So this is... Uh, so as I said, take that, that's what he takes as absolute, and that it is now this way, that there is currently struggle, doesn't tell us anything about whether or not there's always been struggle. Has there always been struggle for survival? And this is where we need to see his presupposed uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the belief that the forces we, that we now observe, in this case, the struggle for survival and its effects on reproduction, have always been operating and in the same way we see them operating today. So that was the word I began with, and I promised you we'd define it. There it is. The forces we now see operating have always been operating, and in about the same magnitude we see them today. And so this can be applied to biology. Darwin's applying it to biology. He got it from Charles Lyell, who was a geologist, and applied it to geology. And you can think about that, right? With rain and erosion, how long would it take to make the Grand Canyon? Current rain. 
and occur in Colorado River, well, that'd take forever, right? And so uniformitarianism says, yep, cool, super old. Or uh, if we assume that, if we, if we apply uniformitarianism to dating methods, like uh, carbon-14, and say it's always been decaying, there's always been these same amounts, and it's always been decaying the same way, it must be really old, right? But you, see, you began with a philosophical presupposition that you haven't proven from the evidence. You've applied it to the evidence. Uniformitarianism. And you've got to pronounce that right, because you don't want to go around saying unitarianism. That's a whole different thing, right? You guys are, pr are probably Trinitarians here, right? All right, yeah, Christians. Yeah. So you can notice the influence on uh, Thomas Malthus in population and economics. So since the current change, uh, current change is brought about by reproduction are very slow, then if they're the origin of species, it must have taken a really long time to get all the species we see, wouldn't it? I mean, think of how long it takes just by natural selection to get changes. And you start off with just two things. And now we have all these different things. Well, that would take a really long time. You see how quickly, once you've granted that assumption, how quickly you get to this conclusion things must be really old. And you may not even see it. It's almost like a kind of sleight of hand. That's usually how that works. Redirect their attention, and pretty quickly you're at very old times. And that's one way the equation could work. Slow forces, long time equals what we see. But the equation also works this way. Uh, stronger forces, less time equals what we see. Right? Both of those give us what we see. So you can see the equation working there. And something similar was done by Lyell in geology. Rain and erosion that we see today are making very <laughs> slow changes, or the slow uh, movement of plates. They're barely perceptible in their motions. And so therefore, if that explains the continents or the mountains, then it must have taken a long time to get them. So this equation is accurate insofar as that presupposition is accurate. And that's what I wanted to teach you about tonight, is how to think critically to identify those kinds of presuppositions. Both the, the, the philosophical problem with it, but then also that you're able to do that in science and not quickly give away the whole name of science. Right? Uniformitarianism is not the same as science. So we can't simply project back into the past what we now observe. How do we know the past was like the present? In the struggle to survive, has that always been the way we see it today? Darwin will have to give us more than just a circular argument. Something like, we have species because of the struggle to survive, and the struggle to survive is because of species competing with each other. We'll need to do better. Why should we accept this? This is a question about origins, and, and insofar as it's a question about origins, it's a philosophical question. Right? Science is studying the present, and it would have to project into the past. It can't actually test the past in a laboratory, can it? I heard you may be building labs here. Can you imagine that? If you're able to build labs that test the past, oh, patent that, right? Some, some sort of J.J. Uh, Abrams time travel mechanism. Or uh, religion, revealed religion just starts with in the beginning God, right? Philosophy is the discipline that critically examines both. So as a question about origins, this is really a philosophical question. Or I would use this phrase in case you're nervous about philosophy. Some people equate philosophy and uh, atheist. I had a student ask me that once. They said, Professor Anderson, you're a philosopher, right? What's it like to be an atheist? So in case you worry about that term, philosophy, how about we use this one? Natural theology. Origins is a matter of natural theology. Has there always been natural evil? Now, Darwin avoids the claim that he's putting the survival of the fittest or natural selection into the place of God. He recognizes that natural selection is not a person. Here in this next quote. It has been said that I speak of natural selection as an active power or deity. But who objects to an author speaking of the attraction of gravity as ruling the movements of the planets? Everyone knows what is meant and is implied by such metaphorical expressions. And then the reason why I picked this quote for you right here especially, but I mean by nature only the aggregate action and product of many natural laws and by the law and by laws the sequence of events as ascertained by us. 
So here he's given us his definition of nature. By nature, he means simply the totality of natural laws or physical laws and the physical events they're describing. So once again, we see this presupposition of uniformitarianism. <coughs> That's because if we're only considering nature in our origin account, then this must mean that only nature exists. That's because uh, there's no other relevant causes besides nature. I mean, what would that mean to say, no, not only nature exists, other things exist, but they don't cause anything. They have no effect on anything. So if there is something non-natural or, or non-physical, that's a little better term, non-natural, that brings up other connotations, non-physical, immaterial, then this too must be taken into account when we describe origins. Indeed, this is one of the distinctive features of God. God is eternal, without beginning, and God is immaterial. God is a spirit. If only nature is called upon in explaining then only nature exists in any relevant sense. And all is natural, all is physical, all is matter. And why should we believe that? Why should we believe all is matter? Is that the scientific view? Science has proven all is matter. How could science ever prove all is matter? It'd be like a dentist saying all is teeth. <laughs> well, it's the only thing I study, so therefore that's the only thing that exists. But yeah, science's domain is the material world. But does it follow from that that only the material world exists? Of course not. That's a philosophical conclusion, and many philosophers have indeed held that view. It was the first philosophical view, the early Greek materialists, they're called, but it's such a weak view, it quickly went out of favor. That's why Plato and Aristotle have the positions they have, because they showed all can't be matter. There are other things, especially called ideas, that aren't material. But then there may have, there's sort of been a resurgence of materialism in the 20th century. Not really different than the early Greek materialists in kind. So why should we believe all is matter? Darwin himself does speak about God. I'll quote that portion soon. And so someone might say that it's inaccurate to claim that he believes all is matter. As a person, Darwin can be more or less consistent. Right? What we're doing partly here is describing what Darwin thinks, but also what we're doing is critical thinking. So Darwin himself may simply have been inconsistent on some point, right? And what we're doing is we're looking at his view and saying, if that view is true, what does it presuppose about reality? So those are two separate things, a biography of Darwin and then Darwinism as a system. So that means that we're going to examine the assumptions that Darwin himself may not have been aware of. He may not have, have realized that if he goes this direction, it means all is matter, or he might have. That's a different issue. If only nature is appealed to, as, a relevant, as relevant to the origin of life or the origin of species, then in that sense, there is only nature. Does that seem safe to say? I want to be sort of like uh, someone always telling you about their imaginary friend and there being no effects seen ever of this imaginary friend. Would you start to doubt their existence? No. So where did nature come from? Where did the material universe come from? And it's no good saying, yes, but where did God come from? It's supposed to be a mind bomb. I saw Richard, a video of Richard Dawkins who said, if a, a theist ever asks you where the universe came from, ask them where God came from. And paused. And it's supposed to be like, right? Uh, no, that, that's not a mind bomb. God is self-existent. Is the material universe self-existent? Or is the very nature of the material world that is dependent and contingent? And that's why we wonder where it came from, right? So it's not a mind bomb at all. One of the reasons Darwin gives to commend his theory to us is that it will open new fields of inquiry for science. It'll, it'll take away some of the clutter. Let me scroll down. A grand and almost untrodden field of inquiry will be opened on the causes and laws of variation, on correlation, on the effects of use and disuse, and the direct action of external conditions, and so forth. <coughs> and he goes here and describes some of the other things. Uh, a new variety raised by man will be more important and interesting subject for study than one more species added to the infinitude of already recorded species. Our classifications will come to be, as far as they can be made, genealogies. 
and will then truly give what may be called the plan of creation. That's a commends your view, doesn't it? This will open up the plan of creation. Now, let me suggest what he's saying. Incidentally, down here at the end, he says, embryology will often reveal to us the structure, in some degree obscured, of the prototypes of each great class. Sort of shows his understanding of, at the time. No, no genetics, right? No DNA, of course. So a kind of rudimentary understanding of, of embryology. And then he says, uh, in the next section, talking about how this will continue to throw light on former changes of climate and the level of the land and will surely be enabled to trace in an admirable manner the former migrations of the inhabitants of the whole world. Even at present, by comparing the differences between the inhabitants of the sea on the opposite sides of a continent and the nature of the various inhabitants on that continent in relation to their apparent means of immigration, some light can be thrown on ancient geography. So this might be one of the most important and motivating factors of naturalism. That in it, this in itself, this, this term naturalism is ambiguous here. I've been using it one way, but it's an ambiguous term. A naturalist might be someone who studies nature. And under that heading, many Christians are naturalists. And perhaps the study of nature has been most strongly advocated by Christians as a study of God's creation. To free the study of nature from superstition is a wonderful and important process. And I think that's partly what he's describing here. To look into the material causes and to learn that there are indeed material causes that are the same everywhere and can be used to explain in many different settings is a powerful insight and a statement to the wisdom of God. So on that level of naturalism, this is giving a natural history and studying the dispersion of plants and animals across the globe along those lines. In contrast to superstition, the goddess of the river did it. Right? Don't uh, go into the forest or don't anger the god of the forest. Superstition. And instead coming to see that we can explain the world through natural causes. I don't know how much we're aware of the, the crushing power of superstition now, but as you study the history of thought and coming from the, uh, when you hear about the scientific revolution, why that was important, if you look into pre-modern superstitions, it was terrible. And it kept the people in ignorance. And that's where the word enlightenment comes from. The enlightenment was set in contrast to those times. So we don't want to allow ourselves to be put into a kind of antinomy, science versus superstition, and all religion comes under the heading superstition. Right? You don't want to be superstitious. You can be a little stitious, but not superstitious. So this is not the same. A naturalist of this kind is not the same as someone who says there is only nature. Such a person might think that they're just continuing that work of ending superstition. God the creator is the last superstition. All is matter. And that's of course how you will hear the new atheists speak, if you know about that group. Religion is equal to superstition. And when they talk about the gods, They'll talk about God, the creator, just like they do Zeus, not knowing there's a significant difference. Zeus is not a creator. He himself was created. So they, this kind of natural says there's only nature. And of course, the problem with superstition wasn't simply that it appealed to non-physical causes. That almost seems to be what the, the naturalist thinks the problem is, simply appealing to non-physical causes. The problem with superstition is it appealed to unreal causes that don't explain anything. That's a problem, right? Appealing to unreal causes. And sometimes in, in this kind of naturalist thinking, uh, non-physical equals unreal. So I told you earlier that one of the ways that Plato got his position in the history of thought is by noting that there are things called ideas. And they're not material. What is the idea of a triangle made of? It's not an accumulation of atoms. Or, or water, or earth, or fire, or wind. It's non-material. So there are non-material things that aren't the same as unreal things. And, and, and in Platonism and Aristotelianism, 
these have very important causal relationships to the world. A thing is a triangle insofar as it's kind of like the form of triangle, right? As a contrast to someone who says, no, these ideas have no causes in the world, no influence. So they have a great amount of influence in the world. So we don't, I'm putting that in there just so you don't allow a, a quick kind of atheism, atheistic materialism. Physical things. Now we could, uh... with, with superstition, we can do simple tests to see if it's true. Simple empirical tests. We can call this Baconian, the Baconian scientific method, and apply these to the superstition stories and see if they're true. Does this potion help you fall in love? The test, right? Would you, would you for that test? I'll sign up. All right. So that's where science comes in. You do tests on things and see are these stories you're telling me true or not. And what turns out in the case of superstition is that they're not. They're fallacies. They're specious reasoning. It's, it's usually what's called post hoc reasoning. After this, therefore, because of this, I wore an amulet. We won the baseball game. Therefore, this amulet causes me to win baseball games. That's post hoc. It could also be that you trained really hard and you had a good diet, right? Exercise. Those could be why you won the baseball game. So post hoc reasoning, superstition falls under that. So that tells us, this kind of scientific method tells us about uh, secondary causes, but these are different than primary causes. And we can't conflate those two things. Secondary causes can't replace primary causes, nor are they the same thing as them. We'll look at what Darwin says about that in a second. If we appeal to only secondary causes for origins, then we've overextended ourselves. Either by appealing, by, by going from the present to the past. Imagine this. Imagine someone who comes to your lovely campus. It's lovely, isn't it? And they say, ACU has always been here. You're currently here. Therefore, you've always been here. Or is that an overextension of the past to the present? Now, you might have just got here, so maybe you think that. You've always been here, but I'm from ASU, so I know the, the back story of how you got here, right? You haven't always been here. So that's the same, that's the same problem uniformitarianism is making, right? The current forces are operating this way, therefore, they must have always been operating this way. So the problem with superstition is not that it appeals to to non-physical causes. The problem with superstition is that it, it is a misunderstanding of secondary causes. Appeals to God are not appeals to secondary causes. Appeals to God are appeals to primary causes. And that's how often the materials will justify themselves. They'll say, look, we can look around. I don't see God, do you? Therefore, God doesn't exist either. But you, these around us are secondary causes. Right? You're, you're looking for the wrong sort of thing. It's like looking for the author. It's like looking for J.R.R. Tolkien in Middle Earth. I don't see Tolkien in Middle Earth anywhere, so that Tolkien doesn't exist. The author of the book is not a character in the book, right? So appeals to God are appeals to primary causes. The, the material monist might say that there are only secondary causes. There's only matter and gravity. But why should we accept this? And why should we allow it to be the source of our explanation of origins and the foundation for all of our studies? And that's what Darwin wants to do in this next quote. He emphasizes that the geological record is incomplete, but also that his theory opens up an entire new areas of study in thinking about natural history. The noble science of geology. Well, you need to study, if you're interested in the history of this, Charles Lyell first, and then Darwin and Charles Lyell's work in geology opened up this idea that we have ages and ages. And since we had ages and ages, that can make sense of why there are different species over such a long period of time. So in this paragraph here, he talks about the uh, vast duration of time that geology has given us. And again here, the duration of the intervals. Think of all the millions of years for each of the layers exposed in the Grand Canyon, right? The slow acting Here it is. The spacing is different on my page. The slow-acting and still-existing causes 
are not by miraculous acts of creation. So he's having, the, the, these are, this is his uh, foil, right? Either it was slow acting causes that gave us geology and species, or it was some kind of intervention by God, a miracle, in, in the secondary level. And so therefore you'll not be able to do any science. Because every time something happens, you'll say, oh, God did it. And that's an easy enough straw man to knock down. So therefore you need to be a Darwinist. Well, that's a false antinomy. Don't accept those. Slow acting, not by miraculous creation, uh, through a long period of time, these have remained unchanged for all these years. So that, that work of Charles Lyell in geology gave Darwin the amounts of time he thinks he needs to explain the origin of species. So we need to go back then to uniformitarianism in geology and ask, is that right? Does it take that long to form what we see around us? Or is there evidence that, in fact, it was formed very quickly through catastrophe? That's the, the alternative to uniformitarianism, is catastrophism. That the Earth was formed by a global catastrophe not that long ago, that the, the rock features of the Earth, not that long ago. And that's why it wouldn't take that much time, because of the power of particularly the water. There were two groups. There were the Vulcanists and the Neptunists. Can you guess what they each thought formed the world? Water or fire, right? Uh, could, what if it's some combination of the uh, deeps being broken up and water? So it doesn't have to be either or. But that was the debate just before Charles Lyell, was how was the world formed through these strong forces? Now, why should we think that there have been long periods of time? Just because it would take the current physical forces a very long time to produce what we see around us. Why not think that the current forces didn't form what we see? Or if they did, they weren't operating at the present rates. If the same physical forces were operating, say water and erosion, but at greater rates than the time than what we see now, then the time needed would be much less. And this can still be a kind of natural history that we'll also see in the next quotes. A natural history is set in contrast to the history we find in redemptive revelation. That history includes both miracles and catastrophes. I mean, think about maybe three big pieces before Abraham. Four. Creation itself. That's why I added four. You can't do that by natural explanations because you're bringing nature into existence. The fall and the curse of natural evil. The global flood and the dispersion of peoples and languages at the Tower of Babel. Right? Those involve divine acts. They're not purely explainable by material causes. And so any natural history that says there's only matter would by its very nature be, in that sense, non-theistic, right? You're not allowing that God did these things. So both of those kinds of things, miracles and catastrophes, would change the world and, way, and, and the apparent age of the world. I use that word on purpose. The apparent age is not the same as the real age. How old does something look versus how old is it? And while those details are known from special revelation, the flood, Babel, we can know from general revelation that God does act for redemptive purposes, and that not only natural causes have formed the earth. I say this as someone who studies natural religion, meaning I want to, to get the word natural right. I'm not opposed to that, the study of what is natural. I don't want that term to be taken over by those who say only matter exists. That's Epicureanism. You've heard of Epicureans? He's maybe best known for hedonism. But what led him to hedonism is he said this, there is no God and there is no soul. Epicurean, only atoms and the void exist. Well, that's what you hear today, right? Only atoms in the void exist, space. Chunks of matter and space is the only thing that exists. Well, that's just Epicurus. And Epicurus is one of the two philosophical schools that Paul encountered when he went to Athens. The Stoics and Epicureans. Instead, we can and should show that there are some things we can know from generation about God. Now, look at this quote. He says, in the future, I see open fields for far more important researches. Psychology will be securely based on the foundations already laid by Mr. Herbert Spencer. 
or, or by Darwinism here, right? So Dar Darwin saw that he's doing work, and, and sorry, one more. Much light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history by this uh, purely natural study, no appeal to the non-physical. Darwin saw his foundation as applying to all areas of human study. We've mentioned biology, geology, economics, but here he brings in psychology. The human mind will be explained only in terms of physical forces. And that is indeed what we've seen happen in the time since Darwin. But is the mind only a physical thing? Or do we have a soul that is immaterial? Can thinking be reduced to the motion of atoms in the brain? You might say that sometimes. Do you ever say that? You think with your brain? Oh, you're an Epicurean. Do you think with your brain or your mind? And where is your mind? Is it behind your eyes? Because that kind of seems like where you're looking out of. And your brain happens to be behind your eyes, therefore you think with your brain. Our thoughts in your brain. So if all can be explained by these secondary forces, these secondary causes, then in effect there is no God and there is no soul. Now the final quote I have here is the dessert that made the meal worth it. By having seen how Darwin presupposes uniformitarianism due to his understanding of naturalism, we can better understand Darwin as a thinker. This tells us nothing about whether his theory is true or not. To know that, we need to do critical thinking about this claim that all is matter. I've already given many suggestions of how that, what direction that would take. I don't think it's very difficult at all to show that all is matter is false. It hasn't been one of the more popular views in history of philosophy. Generally, people tend towards idealism, that only mind exists as more thoughtful than materialism, that only matter exists, because it's very hard to deny, on, I think, right? So the fact of your ideas is very present to you right now, and to reduce those away as matter seems kind of weird. So idealism tends to be more popular in the history of philosophy, but they, there's this antinomy that goes back and forth. So given Darwin's assumptions, let's look at what he says here. This last quote I'm going to give you is a real beauty. Let's look at what he says, and I think it'll help, now that we've come through all these other ones, help make sense of this. To my mind, it accords better with what we know of the laws impressed on matter by the Creator that the production and extinction of the past and present inhabitants of the world should have been due to secondary causes, like those determining the birth and death of the individual. When I view all beings not as special creations, but as the lineal descendants of some few beings which lived long before the first bed of the Cambrian system was deposited, <coughs> they seem to me to become ennobled. Judging from the past, we may safely infer that not one living species will transmit its unalterable, unaltered likeness to a distant futurity. So it's interesting how this whole thing begins. I'd like you to ask your science professor if this is a scientific statement, to my mind it accords better, is more consistent with my understanding of God. Well, that's a theological assertion, not a scientific one. How if we start, how would that work if we start off our science, go into your science lab and say that, to my mind it accords better with how God would do things that the following is the case, right? Well, why is that? Well, because of what he said already, that there's always been suffering. There's always been a struggle for survival. I don't know what happened in the Church of England catechizing classes for young Darwin that he missed Genesis 1 through 3. Uh, and maybe he was aware of it and just thinks it's false and he didn't, didn't catch it. But that's a pretty prominent solution that the Christians have given, right? He's responding to something more like deism. God is perfectly good and made a world like the one we see around us. It's always had suffering. And then look at um, this next one. We may feel certain that the ordinary succession by generation has never once been broken and that no cataclysm has desolated the whole world. Well, what cataclysm do you think he's talking about? 
I mean, he says no, so it means any of them. But I think there was just one major competitor at the time, right, of what the major, of what that cataclysm was, the flood. Now, the first part of that is right. I mean, the flood didn't break succession. It wasn't, human and animals weren't recreated. That was the whole point of Noah's Ark. So there has been a continual uh, lineage back to the beginning. But he's rejecting catastrophism and arguing for uniformitarianism. I don't see anything in this passage or the other parts I've read that would support this besides personal preference. But I think we actually have arguments from general revelation. I, I've used scripture to illustrate it, not as proof. We have arguments from general revelation, which I'll mention briefly, that, that give us reason to think this isn't true. So in Darwin's view, there's always been a struggle to survive. There's always been natural evil. And this is contrary to the idea of God, the creator. God is perfect in power and perfect in goodness. And if God is perfect in power, then he could create a world without evil. And if God is perfect in goodness, then he would create a world without evil. And if he both could and would, then he must have done so. And this is indeed what Genesis tells us. But it's also what is clear from general revelation. And, and it's the whole motivation for the problem of evil which is one of the central problems that all humans face. Why is there evil? The reason why we struggle with that is because we think God is perfect in power and could do something about it, and he's perfectly good and would want to do something about it, right? So God originally made a world that was very good. So Darwinism is not simply problematic because it's in contrast to Genesis and special revelation. Darwinism is problematic because it's in contrast to what is clear about God and the original goodness of creation from general revelation. We've used this as an example to learn to think critically. So let's bring that to a conclusion. We're thinking critically by noticing what presuppositions are operating for Darwin. For the rest of his theory to be true, these presuppositions must be true. And we've elevated the debate by raising our consciousness about these presuppositions. As I look through various debates, it's very rare that I see these presuppositions isolated. I have come across it sometimes. I mentioned the book Darwin's God, but it's very rare. And that's why when I said, has anything new been said? Maybe this isn't new, but it sure seems to be something that's overlooked, particularly that philosophy or natural theology can address these issues. So I've also hinted that we can, through the use of reason, show that it's simply not true that there's always been evil, there's always been suffering and struggle. And that means life was before survival, struggle for survival, which means there were already species before it was introduced. So whatever it affects variation, which is a lovely study, I'm not saying we shouldn't study that, it doesn't tell us anything about origins. Origins is always going to be a, a natural theology issue. So we've at least brought those to, our, to the forefront. And if someone wants to continue to argue for Darwinism, they can say, no, I think there always has been evil, and I think we can only appeal to natural forces whenever we talk about the history of the world. Well, then, in essence, that's uh, materialism, right? There's not going to be some third thing in the middle. Uh, I think we can show that it's not true that only material things exist or act as causes. And it's not true that long periods of time are required to explain what we see around us today in the natural history of the world. So materialism leads to uniformitarianism, which means that if the first materialism is false, so is uniformitarianism. And if that is false, that affects everything from geology, it affects all the dating methods that are used, carbon-14, radioactive decay. Each of these presupposes some kind of uniformitarianism. So critical thinking has also done something else. I mentioned two things. It brings up, it helps us identify our assumptions, but it also helps us preserve meaning. And there's a sense in which we would lose all meaning if matter is all that exists. And a sense in which all is matter doesn't have any meaning itself. We lose meaning because if all is matter, then we don't have a lasting soul. There's no lasting good. And so there's no future and no purpose, if you're just a chunk of atoms. There's really no meaning to what you do. You couldn't evaluate one, one chunk of atoms over another chunk of atoms. When you look at the periodic table, where on the periodic table is good? 
not, it's not on there, right? So, what, which, which of the atoms do you combine to get good? It's, it's a complete category mistake. So if there are only atoms, then there's no good, no highest good. And on top of that, all is matter does not retain meaning because it's a kind of self-referential absurdity. The thought all is matter is itself not matter. In the history of philosophy, idealism has always been the more tempting of the two poles. Idealism saying only mind exists precisely because it, it's impossible to deny your thinking right now. You're conscious. So we've done these two things. We've given an example of how to think critically and an application of this to our studies of origins and purpose. And that's what I'd like to end with, emphasizing this. There are some things about God and humans that are clear from general revelation. We can apply that to our state of origins. Thank you.